Hello, friends. Welcome to the ATC Double Cut. My name is Michael Woods, and I am glad to be back after having traveled around the world, been speaking at a few conferences over the last couple of weeks, and I just have not had any time whatsoever to record anything like an ATC Double Cut podcast. I have made a couple updates on the ATC website since then. So in today's episode, I want to talk with you about the highlights of what is new on the ATC website. The topics range from uh, turfgrass math, making some calculations about fertilizer applications, and there is a video about the OM246 method, and there's a few seminar handouts that I can talk about. And I'll also mention a few of the really interesting updates over on the Pace Turf site as well. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. We can look at, let's see, where did we left, leave off last time? I think the last episode, uh, we talked about the turf grass growth ratio, nitrogen harvest, and fertilizer adjustment post. Uh, that was the episode with Adam Miller. And the next blog post was from late February. It has a title of New OM246 Video Script. And I actually have a link directly to that video in this post. If you haven't watched it, it's only a seven and a half minute video. And in fact, if you look at the time, the estimated reading time for this post, it says that it is a seven minute read. And I guess, um, I guess that the, the calculator that calculates how many minutes it may take to read a post is pretty accurate because uh, it took me seven minutes approximately to read my script. And I had a little preview that I'd recorded at a, a, a mountainous area in Southern Thailand that, that is pasted on at the start of that video. This video was an update that I made for the Ontario Turfgrass Symposium, which was held at the end of February in Canada. And I could not attend that event, but I received an email in late 2023. And it was the kind of surprising email that you sometimes worry when you receive it, if you've made some kind of a mistake. And it said, uh, it was something like uh, speaker profile, photo uh, information and and session summary required. And, I, and it was from the organizer of the Ontario Turfgrass Symposium. And I was like, uh, I, I didn't know I was participating in this event. Have I messed up my travel plans or something like that? Or have I committed to something that I forgot about? Anyway, I checked and and it turned out they were hoping I could join by Zoom or, or some other type of um, uh, video call in. Uh, but with my time schedule, I was not going to be able to do that. But I did offer to make a recorded video, a pre-recorded video that I said we can let that video make its debut at the symposium and then I will make it publicly available later. And what I tried to do in this, I didn't want to take up too much time because there were a lot of people who were there who were actually going to share information, who were going to make in-person presentations. So I, I tried to make this brief and just give an overview of what I know now about OM246 after doing this for seven or eight years. And so I described it in the context of a soil test. And a soil test has four parts. The four parts of a soil test are the sampling method, the laboratory analysis part of the test, the interpretation of the results from the laboratory, and then some recommendations or decisions that are made based on that interpretation of the laboratory analysis. If you divide the test into four parts, that can be a useful way to consider what you need to be doing for each aspect. So I, I broke the video down in that way also. And I, I said, uh, well, like the first line of the recorded script was before the four parts of the OM246 testing process, why are we doing this test? And then I went on to say what the purpose was, how it's done, and 
and I, I went through this whole script, which is, uh, it was about 1,300 words or something like that. So it, it went through all the parts. And I think for a seven minute video, it's, it's more, um, more information packed than when you, what you typically hear from me, because sometimes I'm telling stories or I'm just trying to explain something, but it's not scripted. Whereas this video is scripted. I knew I had a time limit, so I chose every word as carefully as I could. And the backstory on, on recording that, I was in Tokyo. I was in Tokyo for a couple of seminars and some meetings, and I wrote the script in Tokyo, but I had to check out of the hotel and go for multiple meetings in Tokyo and then go to Narita Airport before my flight. Uh, and, and I was going to be flying over the Pacific to the U.S. And I'm like, I really need to get this script recorded so that I can have my audio track and then I can put the video together matching various still images or video clips that I would play while the audio track was explaining what I wanted to show in the video. And uh, so I so I got the script written that that took about an hour or so. I have lots of practice writings and I and I know what I wanted to say about OM246, but I wanted to script it so that I could just go through it exactly without so many ums and ahs and not I didn't want to miss anything. So I got to Narita Airport and I went to the United Airlines lounge. And of course, in the airline lounge, you're supposed to be quiet. <laughs> you're, you're not, uh, you know, you're not supposed to be making a lot of noise in the lounge. And fortunately, I was there about three hours before my flight. And it was a time of day when the, the lounge was not too crowded. So I was back in the, the working section where there's desks and, uh, there was one there was one Chinese guy there with with headphones on and I knew that I wouldn't disturb him because he he had headphones on if I talked and recorded into this microphone I I figured it would be okay for him and there was a Japanese lady a couple desks over and she was very very quiet and I went over and talked with her and said uh, excuse me I need like 10 minutes of making noise here. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. Is it going to be okay? And she, uh, she said, okay, that's okay. But she suggested I go into the phone booth. They have phone booths where you can make phone calls and that's going to block some of the noise. But I knew that that would introduce all kinds of echo into this. So I'm like, let me just try to get through this once, uh, before too many people come into the lounge and before I just, I end up disturbing too many people. And, uh, so I did that. I went and apologized to, to the Japanese lady again, the Chinese guy hadn't noticed that I'd recorded anything and, and I got that recorded. And then on the flight over to Denver, I got, uh, a lot of that video done and, and almost finished it up at the lounge at the Denver airport before I was, uh, catching a connecting flight to Portland. So um, this is uh, this is a video that I had some fun making. And uh, of course, it takes <laughs> hours and hours to make a seven minute video. But I, I think it's got a lot of good information in it. And I do hope that you will check it out. Um, so I, I'm not going to read through the script uh, at, at all, of course, because you can read through it. It's in the blog post. If you want to just read it and not watch it, you can do that. But that was kind of fun. And I've heard some feedback. People said that that was very useful for people who, um, would like to know more about OM246 testing. So there's that one. And then, uh, I was over in New York. I, I was in the Adirondacks. I was on my way to Montreal and I was visiting a uh, sibling who lives in the Adirondacks and there was some snow on the ground and mountains in the background and I had some books shipped there. I'd had some books shipped to me that I was picking up uh, on, on this trip to North America. I sometimes want to get books shipped to me in Thailand or some other places in Asia where I may be staying. 
And unfortunately, the shipping cost on the books can be exorbitant. And so when you when you have to pay a hundred or two hundred dollars for shipping, anybody who uh, who has tried to have international book shipment orders knows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you sometimes hesitate on making that purchase and you wait to get the book until you're in the country where you can get much better shipping deals. So I had some books shipped to my sibling's house and one of them was the mathematics of turfgrass maintenance. So this was already on my mind. And at that time, I also received an email from a correspondent who had a, a question about calculating the a value, the expected plant use in the equation that I use for making a MLSN fertilizer recommendation. And that equation is A plus B minus C equals Q. Q is what we're trying to solve for, what we're trying to find out. That is the quantity of fertilizer that will need to be applied. A is the amount of nutrient that the grass is expected to use. B is the quantity of that nutrient that is, uh, is required to be kept in reserve in the soil, which is the equivalent of the MLSN minimum amount. And C is the quantity of that nutrient in the soil, which we measure by a soil test. If you take A, if you take the quantity A and add it to the quantity B, that's the amount that we need to have, which is plant use plus the amount we need to have in the soil. And if you subtract the amount that we have, which is the soil test amount, the, the difference between the amount that we need and the amount that we have is the amount that needs to be added as fertilizer. And so the question was, I read through your MLSN cheat sheet but have been getting weird numbers when calculating the PPM value for A. So I appreciate that kind of question. And when people don't understand something, I'm, uh, if I, I always am happy to, uh, to explain it. It's just a matter of whether I have time. And at this time I did have time and I, I ended up killing two birds with one stone here because I, I quickly wrote out the email, uh, and then I realized, hey, I've just explained something that some other people might be interested in. So why don't I make a blog post out of it? So what I did here uh, is I, I replied by email and then I took the email answer and made a blog post out of it too. So uh, the final sentence of that was, it takes a bit of practice, but once the conversions have been done a few times, I trust it will make sense and be repeatable for you. If you like to do turf math, that will be a good one for you to check out. And if you'd like a refresher on how you can make that calculation of how much of a nutrient the grass is expected to use, then I would encourage you to read that post. The next one is a podcast recommendation. That one uh, has a title of Testing MLSN. And this is, uh, this is one that I listened to on a flight. Uh, I, think, I think when I was flying Montreal to Newark, uh, I'd been up in Montreal for the Canadian Golf Course Management Conference. And I saw that Joe Galati had a new Talking Greenkeeper podcast out. And he'd, he'd spoke with a golf course superintendent by the name of Daniel Palin. And he is someone who I've, I've noticed on Twitter. I, I'd seen his, or sorry, X on his X account. But I didn't really realize that he was trying MLSN. And it turns out it's very interesting because he, he split the course into two and he did... MLSN on nine holes, and he did a uh, Floratine slash Predict N uh, expensive industry kind of pseudoscience program on the other nine. And it's like, well, you kind of hope that MLSN is going to work okay, but, uh, you know, those other products have lots of marketing behind it. And, you know, the products work. It's just uh, some of the, some of the, 
uh, how do you say it? Yeah, some of it is just unnecessary, and uh, and yeah, it's I don't know. Some people like fertilizing like that. I just like to supply the grass with what it needs. So it was interesting to listen to how that worked out on Joe's podcast, and I was glad to find that MLSN worked just fine. Basically, the equivalent of that proprietary pseudosciency program. And then there, of course, are cost savings involved. And those, those costs that are saved can be reapplied into other improvements to the course. So that was an uh, interesting one to hear. And then um, I responded the, the next one is a good one. I wrote this one in early March, and the title is A Couple Problems with Year-Round Soil Nutrient Analysis. And uh, this was in response to an article by Chris Naff in the USGA Green Section Record, and he suggests making year-round soil nutrient analyses. And uh, I've I've talked with a couple people at the USGA green section. I said, Hey, do you have an editor for the green section record? I'm surprised that this got published. And it's, it's not that the article is so terribly bad. I like soil testing too. I think it's interesting to do testing, uh, frequently, but it just is not going to achieve what I think Chris is proposing that it would. He's, he wrote in the article, he said, to adequately make decisions regarding these crucial fertilizer applications, it is imperative to conduct soil sampling throughout the year to assess soil properties and current nutrient levels, which play a pivotal role in the overall health and performance of the course. To ensure optimal results, it is recommended that sampling be conducted at least three times annually. That, to me, that sounds a little bit, um, mm, a little, it's a strong recommendation to say it is imperative to conduct soil sampling throughout the year. Um, because really with soil, with soil nutrient analysis, soil testing, what we're really trying to do is prevent nutrient deficiencies. Um, you don't really need to know what your nutrient levels are all through the year. You're just trying to prevent nutrient deficiencies and make sure you supply enough fertilizer. So we can, we can just not soil test to begin with and just supply 100% of plant use. Um, and if you, if you just don't soil test and supply the grass 100% of what it can use, you guarantee that you supply all the nutrients that you need that. So that's like the default, that's the default. And that's a hundred percent of what the grass needs. And, and you don't even need to soil test. Okay. So the, the areas where soil testing could, let's see. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't exactly quote, uh, where he, he, he said some of the other reasons why you would soil test, but, but he mentioned, uh, he, he mentioned that if you soil test, you could enhance environmental and economic sustainability. And what that means is only applying the nutrients that are required. So um, what he means by that is if you're applying 100% of plant use, but the soil already has enough nutrients, then it wouldn't be economically or environmentally sustainable to be adding fertilizer that was not required. So it would make sense to do, to do soil testing. Uh, and if you interpreted the test properly, you would then be enhancing environmental and economic sustainability. However, there's a big problem with the way this works in reality. And this has been documented in both the 2014 GCSAA nutrient survey and in the uh, more recent, maybe 2021 or 2022 GCSA Environmental Institute for Golf or, or GCSA Foundation nutrient study. Because in both of those 
in both of those surveys, the one back in 2014 and then the one more recently, it was found that the golf courses that soil test end up applying more fertilizer. They're, they're applying more phosphorus and more potassium than the golf courses that don't soil test. So doing soil testing rather than enhancing environmental and economic sustainability, it actually does the reverse. And the reason for that is because of poor soil test interpretation. And it's because of soil test interpretation that's done in a pseudoscientific way, for example, by some of the fertilizer companies that sell a lot of product to this industry. So the, the way that this can be avoided is to interpret soil tests properly and don't soil test too often. If you're gonna interpret the soil test wrong and end up over applying fertilizer based on a bad interpretation of a soil test, then uh, the more soil testing you do, the more fertilizer you're gonna end up applying, which is not the way it's supposed to work. So I put links in this post to, um, to a couple of articles um, where, where I explained, or I'd work through calculations kind of explaining how this works. Um, uh, let me read one paragraph here, one paragraph. Uh, let's see, I'll read two paragraphs. The GCSA nutrient survey has found that rather than applying nutrients more efficiently when soil testing, golf courses that soil test actually end up applying more nutrients. The reason for that is recommendations for more nutrients than the grass can use and recommendations for more nutrients than the soil can hold. If everyone used MLSN to make fertilizer recommendations from soil test results, that might enhance environmental and economic sustainability. But given the many golf courses that apply fertilizer based on misguided recommendations, testing less frequently would achieve those goals. Testing year round would have the effect of causing more unnecessary fertilizer to be applied. I uh, haven't talked with Chris about this. I, I emailed him and haven't heard back, but I think I'm going to see him in a few weeks. Uh, and, and that is the topic of the next post and the final one that I'm going to talk about. This one has the title of five down, one to go. And it mentions that in 2024, I have been speaking at a few conferences and seminars. I was in, uh, let's see, how did I do it? I, I started off with two seminars in Hong Kong. Uh, then I had two more in Tokyo. I prepared that video that I mentioned for the Ontario Turfgrass Symposium. So that's three events that I was a part of. I delivered two seminars in Montreal at the Canadian Golf Course Management Conference. And then I was in Pattaya in Thailand, where I gave three seminars with the Thailand Golf Course Superintendents Association at their Sustainable Turfgrass Management in Asia Conference which was back after a five-year hiatus. And it was fun to see so many friends and uh, acquaintances from uh, all over the world who joined us in Thailand last week. So that was five, five events down and one to go. The one to go is the Palmetto GCSA education meeting on April 3rd uh, and that is going to be held at Ori Georgetown Technical College in or very near Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. That's open to the public. So I hope that a lot of Palmetto GCSA members will come. And, and if you're anywhere in the area, I hope you will come over and come to that event. In the morning, I'm going to be talking about systematic improvement of course conditions. In the afternoon, we're going to have a bit of a field day. I hope Chris Neff will be there so we can talk about soil testing, which I really like soil testing. And I was so glad that he also liked soil testing, but I have a different opinion about how frequently the soil testing should be done to be most effective. So I'd like to talk with him about that. 
And I know Jordan Booth, Dr. Jordan Booth from the USGA Green Section will be at this event. He's also speaking in the morning, and I think he may be demonstrating the GS3 Smart Ball from the USGA in the afternoon. So I'm excited to see that. So there are all kinds of fun events that are uh, that I've that I've participated in, and I, I'm sure I've seen many of you at these conferences over the past few months. And then I'm really looking forward to this one, which uh, it's rare for me to speak in the United States. I was at the Regal Live event. I'm uh, I've got my Regal Live uh, Carhartt shirt on uh, now. And uh, I spoke there in early December, and it was really a treat to have a chance to talk directly with so many, uh, so many people in the United States. And I'm glad to be back in that part of the world uh, on April 3rd for the Palmetto GCSA education meeting. So that is going to be, um, that is going to be a good time and I am already, I've already been in touch with, um, with Jim Huntoon at Ori Georgetown about how to prepare for speaking to both the students and to the superintendents. And I have some really good information, I think, to share that I think, um, I, I'm, I'm excited about how I'm going to present that material. So, um, that is, is one to go. And then I'm not going to have to do so many seminars anymore. Maybe I'll have more time for podcasts and writing and stuff like that. Now, um, I mentioned that I would share a little bit about Pace Turf. And I've been doing some updates over there as well. I, I think some of those recent updates are even more interesting than what I've been writing about on the Pace Turf site, uh, sorry, on the ATC site. And of course, I know um, many of you who listen to this are already Pace Turf subscribers, and I appreciate that. I, I was surprised in Montreal, I talked with some people uh, who asked me, what is my role with Pace Turf? And am I like the owner of it? Or, or they weren't quite sure what my role was with Pace Turf. I've been the owner of Pace Turf for a couple of years now. I'm, I'm the director of the Pace Turf Information Service. And this is a website where you can get all kinds of good information. And I post updates there every week. And some of those updates, I'm sure, are of interest to you. Now, in addition to the updates on the Pace Turf site, there's also weather information. And there's a huge archive of quality controlled, uh, peer reviewed by doctors, Larry Stoll and Wendy Galerter, the founders of Pace Turf, a lot of really quality reference material for many types of turf grass, weed problems, disease problems, uh, physical problems, uh, just, just about any type of problem or concern that you might have water quality issues. There are reference materials that are prepared by professionals and providing actionable information uh, and solid recommendations that are all right there in that Pace Turf uh, reference area. But then there's also updates, and uh, one I posted yesterday is about the coefficient of uniformity for sand root zone material. I've talked with a lot of people about this, and uh, it took me a long time to figure out how to calculate it. I first tried to calculate the coefficient of uniformity in 2015 or so. And I wrote an email to Dr. Norm Hummel and he told me he didn't know the equation because he gets the CU from a software program that they had at the lab. And that was kind of disappointing. So I set that aside and I've attacked the problem at various times over uh, over the last couple of years. And finally, uh, in 2023, I, I figured out how to solve it. A at least I can calculate the coefficient of uniformity exactly the same way it's done at the turf and soil diagnostics lab and exactly the way it's done at Brookside labs. And I found out that they are using a slightly different equation to calculate it. Uh, it it's not a meaningful difference, but 
uh, it's just a couple of uh, a couple of decimal points, and it's it's a very small number of decimal points. So you might get like uh, a one point. Uh, let's say you get like a 1.72 using one method and you get a 1.66 uh, using a different method. If you plot those results on a line, um, they're they're exactly linear. So uh, I've, I, I know how I can duplicate exactly the number that comes on a Brookside report. I can duplicate exactly what comes on a current turf and soil diagnostics report. And yesterday I was checking on this because... I like to calculate the coefficient of uniformity for the zero to two centimeter layer on a uh, on an OM246 test, and also at the four to six at the two to four and at the four to six centimeter depths. I find it useful to know how that is changing over time because people are putting sand top dressing with the purpose of modifying the root zone or of keeping the root zone consistent over time. And it's nice to see not only how the organic material is changing by depth, but also how the sand particle sizes. And one of the really interesting things to look at with sand particle sizes is the coefficient of uniformity or the CU. A higher CU means the surface is going to compact more and uh, potentially be a firmer surface for ball reaction. And a lower CU means you're going to have a lot of particles that are more similar in size. And when you don't have a range of small, medium, and large particles, then they, they can't pack together as well. So you get something that's even more resistant to compaction but not just resistant to compaction, it's resistant to, to setting up and, and, and kind of uh, becoming the type of firm surface that we might want. Uh, uh, something with a really low CU is the kind of surface that leaves uh, big footprints or, or leaves triplex tire marks or sprayer marks or top dresser marks uh, when you're going across the surface. So uh, I... I made a chart about that and I, I wrote that update uh, yesterday that is uh, on the Pace Turf site. Some of the other ones uh, include some advice for monitoring soil moisture, saying uh, it's time to start as the season warms up. And on the Pace Turf site, you'll find these type of timely updates uh, and recommendations about how to do various techniques and, and some of the problems uh, or some of the weather uh, things that may be happening. A couple of weeks ago, I wrote about the El Nino Southern Oscillation Forecast Update, or ENSO, and uh, this looks at what the government forecast is with the scientists from the uh, Climate Prediction Center from the United States National Weather Service, and they're saying that uh, a transition from El Nino to a neutral condition is likely with a 79% chance by April to June of this year. And they've got a 55% chance of a La Nina weather pattern developing in June to August. So um, there's there's that type of update. And uh, some of the other stuff, I, I reviewed a paper uh, about humic and fulvic acid application uh, where it had no effect. I was... I. So, so I wrote about that, that, uh, that's the kind of update that sometimes I would put this kind of thing on the ATC site. Now I'm sometimes putting it over on Pace Turf. Also, uh, on Pace Turf, I put uh, normal leaf nitrogen content for putting green grasses. This is summarizing some research that I've done over the past five years. And this is stuff that, um, I, I, I share with my consulting clients, I share with ATC's soil testing clients. This is the type of stuff that will be public eventually. Um, but right now it's it's on the Pace Turf site. When you're predicting how much nutrients are being harvested through clipping volume, if you're not measuring the clippings every time, then you need to estimate something that's reasonably normal. And I've usually used for creeping bent grass, I've used 4% uh, 
as what I expect to be normal. But when I've actually measured it with quite a few measurements from multiple greens in multiple countries, the median value, and I've, oh, I've also done this, you know, from the start of the season through mid season through to the end of the season. So when I've done this, the average, the median value is actually 4.9%. The, uh, the interquartile range, meaning, uh, 25% of the samples up to 75% of the samples are from 4.3% to 5.3%. And the median for creeping bent grass is 4.9%. So when I'm estimating nutrient harvest for creeping bent grass now, I suggest using a value of 4.9% and, and updating that from the 4% that a lot of people are using and that I've recommended in the past. I also shared in this update that I would use 3.7 for hybrid Bermuda grass, 3.4% for seashore paspalum, and 2.2% for zoysia metrella. I tried to share this type of practical advice. I also uh, had another post on there with the title, Nitrogen Harvested in Clippings, Calculation Update for 2024. And I worked through exactly how to make that calculation. Um, so I'm not going to read about that on a video or a podcast, but you can read about that if you are a, a PaceTurf subscriber. So for people who want to get this type of information, um, I'm, I, I, I do put quite a bit of, of useful material over on the PaceTurf website also. So it's not, it's not only... Uh, information that I'm sharing on the ATC website. People often write to me and, and they say, you know, thanks for all you do for this industry. Um, like I'm a volunteer or something. And uh, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate the sentiment uh, when people are, are, are telling me that. Um, but I, I do this because it is fun for me. I do this because it is a hobby for me. I do this because I have a passion for it and because I've worked at it long enough and studied it constantly and study, studied it enough that I feel that I'm pretty good at it, you know, with some aspects of, of developing reasonable ideas about turf grass management, updating those ideas as new information becomes available, and then sharing and explaining that advice and that information in ways that people can make use of it. Uh, but I don't just uh, I don't just do it because I want to be a volunteer. So uh, now that I am the owner and operator and the director of the Pace Turf Information Service, I can put some of the material on there and charge a fee for it. So if you are not yet a Pace Turf subscriber, I will make a recommendation again. It's only $275 per year. You get the value for that, I think. I, I always describe the value for it as you get that one time when you have the issue of, oh no, I need to check about recommended leaching amounts to manage salinity. Uh, and, and if you've noticed that your irrigation water salinity is a little bit higher than it was last year, you want to update about how much uh, salinity amounts, uh, sorry, how much leaching amount you need to do with your irrigation, you can find that type of information very quickly at the Pace Turf website. So when you solve that problem and you realize, okay, now I know that I need to leach like this, that keeps the grass in good condition. It prevents problems. That to me, having access to that information, that is worth $275 right there. Um, and uh, then there's, there's the weather updates. There's the disease prediction. You see so much of the stuff that uh, some of the chemical companies are doing now, what, what Syngenta is doing with uh, some of their apps. And they're doing this disease prediction stuff. And uh, that all of that stuff has been in the Pace Turf uh, website. And it still is a service that Pace Turf subscribers get. Uh, 
it's been there for years. Uh, and of course we don't, uh, we don't really bother marketing it, but for the loyal paster subscribers who subs who resubscribe year after year uh, and and take advantage of this, uh, they they can tell you that this is quite a useful uh, and solid bit of information that can be used as part of the toolbox for maintaining and producing high quality turf in a logical, sustainable and fun way. So that is, uh, I, I guess we can say that this episode of the ATC Double Cut is also brought to you by our sponsor, Pace Turf. Thank you for that, Pace. Now I will go ahead and sign off, uh, promising to be back again before too long with more interesting turf grass information. For ATC from Hokkaido, Japan, I'm Michael Woods. Bye-bye.